Uh, spiritual warfare is, uh, I'm going to really simplify because it can sound kind of, you can have some preconceived ideas about what spiritual warfare is. And, it, and today it sounds kind of crazy. It sounds like, what is that? Is that relevant to my life? And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the armor of God, what it is. And it's going to be super simple. And you're going to leave here realizing, wow, I'm, I'm ready. I'm like battle ready right now. There's nothing more that needs to be added. There's nothing more for me to do. And um, so when the attacks of the enemy come, it's not a matter of being defeated. Defeat is not an option. It's not even uh, a possibility when you understand this armor, when you understand what God's given you. So we've been looking at rest, right, the last few weeks. And we're going to continue looking at rest. And uh, actually, the title of today's message is The Battle at Rephidim. And uh, before we get into that, though, uh, in talking about spiritual warfare, I want you to realize that you and I are caught in the battle of the ages. We are smack dab in the middle of a battle that has been waging in human years, in lateral human years, for ages and ages. Let me explain. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as, as uh, fall as lightning from heaven. It's like, you know, it's like this picture that Jesus is in heaven probably just pouring a fresh cup of coffee. And then all of a sudden, here's this flash of lightning behind him. And he turns. He's like, oh, Lucifer's gone. And there go a third of the angels. Like, nothing happened. What happened was Lucifer, who today is... I think it's not. Lucifer, who is one of the... Uh, there was the archangels made. The, one of the cherubim. The, uh, today we see the mercy seat, which we've talked about a lot. The two cherubim. Well, uh, Lucifer was a mighty cherub created. And, you know, like we talked about, God makes in threes, and I believe that he would have been the third one. And he had deceived, however he did, he deceived a third of the angels to go against and bring a coup against God. That's right. It sounds pretty insane, right? But, but let me explain it. If you understand Satan's thinking behind this, it's not that far-fetched. Yeah. And let me explain. See, what happens is God is just, perfect, and righteous. He's also love. So what happens is here God creates man, right? He loves man. He loves his creation more than anything. He, he finishes everything for man and then, and then creates man and gives him everything, supplies everything for him just because he loves him and wants to enjoy life with him. That's why, we, that's why we're here is because he loves you and he wants you. And so he creates man and Satan... At this time, remember, he's created one of the mighty cherub, and the cherub, they are protectors of God's righteousness. Right. Remember, they were the ones standing with the flaming swords in front of, in front of the, the tree of life, protecting, uh, keeping man from eating of the tree of life, because if they would have eaten it, they would have remained in that state forever. So they are protectors of God's holiness, protectors of God's righteousness. So in a perverted way, though he's fallen, he was still created as a protector of God's righteousness. So he, knowing God's justice and God's righteousness, knows if I can get man to do what I did, how can God love him? But he Because he sees how much God loves his man. So he's thinking if God was to bypass his justice and righteousness and continue loving man and bless man, disregarding their sin, Satan's got him. As soon as God goes against his own justice... And stops being righteous and perfect and holy, he's no longer God. And Satan has a right as a coup to the throne. So you can see his thinking here. He's a protector. He understands how righteous God is. He understands how just and perfect he is. But he also sees how much he loves man. So if I can get man to sin, what's God going to do? You can't keep loving him. You can't keep blessing him. You can't keep doing that. And so obviously man sins and Satan thinks he's got him. But God had uh, a plan set in motion actually before any of this happened and we see it as a mystery hidden in ages that God's righteousness and justice and perfection see during the Old Testament uh, from Exodus to Malachi except for Genesis and Job it's a time of completely under the law and these people are under the law and it's a picture of that love even though God loves man love does not have power over the law love is powerless when a man is under law. Picture King Darius and, da and, and Daniel. King Darius loved Daniel, yet he was deceived into making a law that if any man prayed to another god or someone other than King Darius for 30 days, they would be cast into the lion's den. And he was deceived. 
Because da Daniel was one of the, the leaders and governors of the land, and King Darius thought this was agreed upon by, by Daniel. He was deceived. And so he puts this law into action. And King Darius loves Daniel, and everybody else was jealous because he was Jewish. He wasn't from Babylon. He wasn't ba Babylonian. And so even though the king loved Daniel, the king could not stop the law from punishing Daniel that, that Daniel was going into the lion's den. King Darius stayed up all night trying to find a way that he could rescue him. But love was powerless against the law. And we see what happened, that Daniel was rescued. And so how does God then keep his justice and his righteousness and yet bless you even though we have all these laws? Even though we have this law that is hindering us from accessing intimacy with God? How do we access this love and this intimacy with this law in between us? See, the law was God's way back then. It was his provision for accessing man. If you obey my commandments, then you'll be blessed. Right. But we realize now, we see as everybody failed, that nobody could actually fully keep the law. Nobody could fully obey everything. So God had another provision for them, which was animal sacrifice. And as long as Israel was had the temple going, had the animal sacrifice going, had the blood on the altar, on the mercy seat, they were good. Yeah. But what happened was, when they got into the promised land, the land of rest, where the enemies are, they didn't fully annihilate all of them. So they started intermingling with the Israelites. The kids started marrying their daughters, and next thing you know is they're worshiping other gods. And as soon as you start worshiping other gods, no longer are you conscious of the blood. You're conscious of yourself. And so what happened is they end up going to Babylonian captivity. So how does God take care of this? How does God not ignore his justice, but how does he bless us and love us and be just at the same time. He said, I don't want man to experience any of this. So I'm going to send my son. My own son. So that man doesn't have to touch this. Man doesn't have to pay the price. I'm going to send my son and I, to be just and to be righteous. I'm going to punish your sin, your screw up, your mistake. I'm going to punish my son in your place. That's the mystery of how God can be just and righteous and love you despite all of our failures. Amen. Amen. It's because your failure what didn't go unpunished. If your failure, every sin you've ever committed, if it did not go unpunished, God would be unrighteous. God would be unjust. And if he's unjust, Satan has a way to get to his throne. He would be actually putting himself under Satan. And I'm saying this in the most reverent way. I'm not saying... In, in irreverent lead to God. He knows my heart. But he, what my point is, he is perfectly just and perfectly righteous. And so with the enemy today, what does he do? And that's what we're talking about. What is his method, his MO? What does he do? He still has a perverted way and tries to get you convinced that he can't bless you because of something you've done. He's, he tries to get you condemned and guilty. He tries to get you living a lie. And that's what we're going to talk about. So we're starting in Exodus chapter 17. I want you to see this. Uh, from We talked from for Israel, the children of Israel from Egypt to Mount Sinai is a period of grace. There was no law given. After Mount Sinai, the law was given at Mount Sinai. Now the children of Israel are under law. Real practical, real easy to understand. Check it out. Under grace from Egypt to Mount Sinai, nobody died. Everybody's healthy, strong, good to go. In fact, they sinned, they murmured, they complained. No punishment. In fact, fresh blessing. Was it that God was ignoring their sin? Absolutely not, because there was coming a, a time where his son would pay the penalty for everybody's sin. You come to Mount Sinai now, they did the same murmur, the same complaint. And now instead of fresh blessing, it's fresh judgment. Because there's a law. And they broke God's law. Now you got fiery serpents coming out. But you know what the answer was to the fiery serpents that bit them? The answer to that condemnation that you sinned, that you made a mistake? It was take a serpent and put it on the pole. Picture of Jesus. That he would pay the price. And everybody that looked upon it and saw it were healed. Okay, so we see from Egypt to Mount Sinai, pure grace. Now, I was curious and curious, what kind of battle 
did the children of Israel have to fight during that time? Because that would be a great picture for us. Today, you and I are fully under grace. We are not under law. Romans 7 says that we are dead to the law through the death of Jesus. That because we are married to the law, there's no divorce. You can't divorce the law. The only way out is for you to die. But God doesn't want you to die. So God sends his son to die in your place. And so through Jesus' death, he provided you the death that you are dead to the law. And now you're a new creation married to Jesus to bear fruit to God. Okay, So you guys lost my, my mode of thinking. <laughs> Are you all getting excited? No. Okay. So, but what was this battle that the children of Israel faced? No, I don't mind. Y'all didn't tell us. Okay. Right. You know, we're, we're family. But uh, so what was the battle that they, with, that they had to fight? And what's really interesting is there was one battle. This time under grace, there was one battle they fought. Just one. And that's what we're looking at. Exodus. It took place in Exodus chapter 17. While the people of Israel were still at Rephidim. There it is. What would you assume the word Rephidim means? Resting place. Resting place. So this is telling me that under grace, we've been talking about it for over a month now. What do we do? What is grace equal? You rest. The work's been done. And so look, the children of Israel, they didn't have to work to get out of Egypt. They didn't have to work to split the Red Sea. They just walk in strengthened by God. Right? Amen. And so here they are in a resting place. Here you are. You're chilling. You're at home, minding your own business, enjoying the presence of God. And then, boom, something happens. Some kind of attack. Something outside that you don't control, that you have no effect on, comes up from behind and attacks you. In your rest. So what does this paint a picture of what the devil's trying to do? What is he trying to get you out of? Rest. He's trying to get you out of rest. Because if he can get you out of rest, he can start playing with your mind. Mm -hmm. He can start telling you lies. Start telling you things about who you are. You're stupid. You're an idiot. You're a failure. You've got no future. You can't do this. You can't do that. This is impossible. That's not possible. And he starts telling you, next thing you know, even though the truth of God's word is there and it's true, because you are focused and believing a lie, you won't be walking in the truth. Even though it's true, because you don't know, because you're not believing it, you're not resting in it. So the devil comes to get us out of rest. And then look what Moses commanded. Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow, I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. Now, real quick, side note, Amalek, let's check this out. There's all these deep, nothing is there by accident, okay? Amalek, they just happen to be the descendants of somebody named Esau. So let's go to the next verse here, Genesis. Genesis chapter 27. So Jacob went over, so we know we have, uh, we have Jacob and we have Esau. They're the, the first twins, right? That was a trivia question we had. Who were the first twins in the Bible? And it's like you're trying to think, like, oh, yeah, duh. But uh, Esau came out first. And, and anyways, we're not waste time with that. Okay, so here uh, 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 Isaac is about to die, right? He's, he's not, no, actually, he's just old and he's going to give the blessing and all that. And so here's. Uh, Jacob and Esau going for the blessing. Now, God had told uh, that Jacob would, that Esau would serve the older brother, that Esau would serve Jacob. Okay, sorry. Esau's the older brother. Jacob's the younger brother. So it should be that Jacob serves Esau. But God said, no, Esau's going to serve Jacob, that Jacob is my chosen one. Jacob's the one that's going to get the blessing. Okay, so we see, though, even though God said it, we see the mom and Jacob still conniving and scheming to get the blessing, which wasn't necessary, but they did it. And anyway, so this, but this is the point I want to make. Let's look at this. The two blessings, okay? So Jacob gets the blessing. Let's read it. Jacob went over and kissed him when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes. He was finally convinced, and he blessed his son and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the outdoors, which the Lord has blessed. Now, he's totally deceiving his dad. He put on Esau's clothes and put on, like, fake hair and all this stuff, pretending to be Esau. Because Esau was a hairy beast. And uh, verse 28, from the, dew, from the dew of heaven and the richness of the, okay, oh, this, okay Lord, which, which the Lord has blessed. This is the blessing. From the dew of heaven and the richness of the earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May many nations become your servants and may they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. All who curse you will be cursed, and all who bless you will be blessed. Now, real quick side note, look at this. Because a lot of people today have this idea that Old Testament people were blessed physically, New Testament people are just blessed spiritually. You know, and it gets confusing because 
uh, people understand, like uh, Ephesians chapter 1, it says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Yeah. But I want to clarify this for you. That spiritual blessings is referring to the place of origin. God is the source of all blessing. Right. Now, unless God like switched from being spirit one second and is like natural, then every blessing in the history from God is a spiritual blessing. Yeah. Do you understand? That anything before it's physical and seen is spiritual yeah. first. Yeah, that's right. All right? Yeah. And we see this here with Jacob. What did he get blessed with first? The dew of heaven. And the dew of heaven, according to Solomon in Proverbs, is what? Favor. So what preceded the natural abundance in life? Favor. Grace. So God's blessing on, the, on Jacob here was grace. And grace took care of everything for him. Now let's go to the next. Let's look at Esau. Esau comes crying to Jacob. Why is there no more blessing for me? I, or Isaac said, Esau, I've made Jacob your master and I've declared that all his brothers will be his servants. I've guaranteed him an abundance of grain and wine. What is, what is left for me to give you, my son? Esau, clear. But do you have only one blessing? Oh, my father, bless me too. Then Esau broke down and wept. Now don't feel too bad for him. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. He had no respect for the birthright, so don't feel bad for him. Like, here, here he's crying. He gave it up. All right, anyways. Finally, he's, he's crying his eyes out. And finally, he's like, I, he's like fine. Uh, you, this is his blessing now. Let's look at his blessing. Now, I want you to remember the one we just read, the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, right? And before that, he said, the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you with the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth. Look at his blessing. Finally, his father said, you will live away from the richness of the earth. That's, uh, I wrote that wrong, I'm sorry. You will live with the richness of the earth and away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you decide to break free, you shall shake his yoke from your neck. Now, what is missing between this blessing and the other blessing? Number one is God. Number two is favor. And number three, he's got to fight for everything. So are you getting the different picture of those under rest with God's blessing and those who have to fight for everything? Those that have to scheme, connive, and fight, 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 whatever it is I need instead of believing God for it and trusting him for it and going to him for it, I'm going to fight for it. And that was Esau's blessing, and that's what Esau had to do. So now we understand the, the anger and the hatred that Esau had for Jacob. For Jacob, everything came easy because it was from God. It wasn't of his labor. You understand? Esau had to fight for it. It was of his labor, which would never produce what God's favor produced. Amen. And so now we fast forward to Amalek, who is attacking the Israelites. It's a picture of Esau attacking Jacob. That here the Israelites are under his grace. And here come these that have to fight for everything, come up from behind to bite you in the back. And now it's easy to point it out and say, well, that's what the devil did. But also, you know, that there are influences in your life, maybe even Christians and other people that mean well. But instead of bringing you to a place of rest in Jesus, they're telling, oh, there's so much more you need. You need to go pray. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. That's all good. That's all good. But your prayers don't bring the results. It's the goodness of God and the blood of Jesus that brings the results. We pray because that's how I receive it. Amen. Because when you pray and you talk to him, it's you're stepping into receiving mode. You're not trying to get mode. You're receiving mode. Why? Because his hands are open. You're under that blessing. Amen. The dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth. So we see this. Now let's go uh, to Exodus here. While the people of Israel were still at resting places, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill. Now, of course... For, for God, they're under grace right now, right? And for God to give them victory, how does he give them victory righteously? How does he interfere? How does he get involved and protect them? This is key because it's what you and I, every day on a daily basis, have the opportunity to choose whether I'm going to fight or I'm going to rest. Whether I'm going to fight, I'm going to battle, or I'm going to rest. I'm going to rest. And what are you resting in? So here goes Moses. I'm going to go up to the top of the hill. It's a painting a picture for you. Someone else went to the top of a hill. And what did he do? Holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses commanded and fought the army. I'm like, meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of the nearby hill. Uh, next up. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. 
Are you getting the picture? Yes. Moses' arms soon became so tired that he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. Mm -hmm. So his hands held steady until sunset. It's a picture of Moses on top of the hill doing this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What gave them the victory? Was it their fighting ability? Absolutely not. Remember, they're slaves in Egypt. What fighting ability do they have? They're fresh. They're days away from Egypt. And yet they're defeating armies. Why? What gave them the victory? It was a shadow of Jesus. A shadow of his crucifixion. See, everything in the Bible, everything in life, our rest isn't because I'm just resting. It's because Jesus at the cross, because of his crucifixion, he took care of it all for me. Yes. It was God's righteousness and justice and mercy and love kissing at the cross so that you and I can be under grace and free today. So that you and I can rest. That's why we worship and say, wow, thank you. Because of what Jesus did. And notice here a little side note too. As your leaders go, you know, as I come to the side for my side note, Jesus, I don't know if you caught on or not, but notice this too, that as the children of Israel's leaders went, so did the nation. See, there's some time, you, you know, we, we can look at leaders, pastors, uh, people, whoever, as superhuman, uh, above, you know, like, oh, you, not that you think I'm in but maybe there's some of you like, oh, that's, that's so-and-so. You know, he doesn't have any problems. You know, he's not experiencing this and experiencing that. But I want you to realize that with, with leadership, God appointed leadership comes a big target on their back. And we are not Jesus. We are on our way being established in his grace. We are learning. We are growing in him. But we leaders need you to hold up our hands. And you do that through prayer. When you lift us up in prayer, you don't know perhaps what I'm going through today. Because as we're going to see today, we are in the middle of a galactic war that has been going on for ages. And there's an enemy that hates you and hates me. And the best way he can get to you is by getting to me. And so he knows the quickest and easiest, because he's lazy too. So the easiest and quickest way I can get across to you, instead of having to do like 20 battles, I'll do one with Josh. I'll do one with Nick. I'll do one with the worship team. Get them in strife. Get them hating each other. Do this. Get over here. Get over here. Attack their marriages during the week and, and do this and do that. Try to get. And so then all you come to church and you know, I don't want to go out here. I'm just here because I have to, you know. And he's trying to get. That's an enemy out. And sometimes we need you. Not sometimes. All the time. You be praying for your leaders. You be praying for me and my wife. You be praying for our marriage. And what are you doing? You are the Aaron and her holding up our hands so that the victory. We're, 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 like Moses was a shadow of Jesus. We are giving the substance of Jesus here at this church. We are bringing him out. We are talking about his glorious victory. And so I need your help to lift us up so that we can do that effectively. Amen. Amen. That's true. <laughs> All right, let's look at this now. Let's go to Judges. Judges 13. So the woman bore a son. We're going to talk about Samson real quick. Now, I know I mentioned this before, and I love it because I don't look at Samson as uh, a giant buff guy. In fact, there's no scripture that says that he looked like that. I know we have our cartoons and our pictures of Samson that he's this beast. But then again, that takes away a lot of God's glory because he's a beast. You know, you wouldn't be surprised when you hear that Goliath kill some people because obviously right i mean duh he's goliath he's 10 feet or whatever and carries around 700 pounds of armor you would expect that but what you wouldn't expect is a scrawny little guy like josh to go care kill a thousand people with the, with the jawbone that'd be a little unexpected like man what the heck and then god gets the glory you see what i mean now i'm not saying he was buff or wasn't it's i'm just saying i personally believe he was probably maybe on the skinny side or on the smaller side. I don't believe he was some big giant. I believe God works that way, right? But the source of his strength, right? So let's look at this. Uh, again, because every big act he did wasn't, it never says because he was strong. I want you to understand that Samson wasn't strong and did a great exploits because he was strong. And some of the, the problems, like I have always had is, you gotta be a strong Christian. You gotta be strong. Be strong, be strong, be strong. No, no, you can't. No. And the more you try to be strong, the more you're going to fail, as we're going to look in a second where our strength comes from. Samson wasn't strong because he was strong. Samson was strong because somebody named the Holy Spirit joined himself with him at periods of time. 
You and I don't have periods of time. We have all the time. So I want you to see that what happened with Samson isn't a fluke. It's what he does. It's what he does daily. All right? So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. I totally left out the father's name. Anyways, what do you think the father's name means? Rest. His root, the root word of Samson's name, I'm having a brain fart what his name was, I left it out. Hey, the root word of his name is rest. So rest has fruit and bears a son named Samson, and this person was sanctified to God as a Nazarite. We're not going to get into that, but the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at the camp of Dan between Zor and Eshel. Look what the Spirit of the Lord did. Came up mightily upon him. See, I want you to, it's not that Samson was strong. Mm -hmm. Not that he's anything special. It's that the Spirit of the Lord is what's special that came upon him mightily, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. I don't even think I could tear apart a young goat. <laughs> but, you know, the comedy there. Though he had nothing in his hand. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down into Asher, and he killed 30 of their men. Okay, let's go to the next one. Look at 15. Well, verse 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a, of a donkey. And I want you to get this. Why a fresh jawbone of a donkey? It's a picture of, again, rest. Rest is resting from all flesh. You have no confidence in the flesh. And so notice the donkey died, but he still had flesh on his body. Couldn't be used. The donkey rots some more. The birds come pick it up, but there's still some flesh on the donkey. God can't use it. God can't use the donkey. Not until all the flesh is gone and all that's left is the dry jawbone, right. is God able to use him. For instance, Moses, the Bible says, was mighty in speech, mighty in understanding, mighty in wisdom while he was in Egypt. And God couldn't use him. When Moses tried to deliver God's people... How did he try to do it? Himself. By his flesh. And he killed an Egyptian and couldn't even bury him right. <laughs> we do nothing right when it's of the flesh. And so what did God have to do? God had to send him away for 40 years and wait for him to drive to where he had no confidence in his flesh. Then he's a stutterer. Then he has no confidence in his inability to speak. And then God says, I can use you. I can use you. But see, it's a picture of rest. No confidence in yourself. No confidence in what you are able to do. All the confidence in what he does. All the confidence in what he is doing. And that's the message of rest, is that I'm resting because I don't trust me. I don't trust my flesh. What I want, what I dream of, what I see in the future, I cannot do. I cannot experience. I need you to do it. And if you don't do it, well, then it's not done. That's right. And that's the kind of freedom of life you get to live. Okay? And so uh, the fresh John would kill a thousand men. I wish people would do movies of these, you know. It'd be pretty cool. All right, let's go next. Uh, and it came to pass when she pestered him daily. Now, what happened is the devil we saw in Rephidim came and tried to get them out of rest. Right? And so Samson is a picture of rest. He was strong because he rested. He was a picture, a fruit of rest. So as long as you rest, you're strong. As long as you're resting, you're strong in him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. And so what does the devil do? He tries to get you out of rest. And now Samson had long hair. He wasn't allowed to cut it. And in that hair, he had seven locks. A picture seven is a number for rest, perfection. And so the source of his strength, I mean, his hair, but it's deeper than that. It's his rest in God. And so what does the devil do? He wants to get at his rest. And so look what he does. He sends a woman, a Philistine woman named Delilah. And look what Delilah did. Verse 16, and it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart. Now this is key in what the devil does. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we see that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And that word devices comes from a Greek word, nos, or noose or whatever, which refers to some Greek callers gave mind games. So the devil's name in Greek is Diablos, which means someone who continually, it's not really his personal name. His personal name would be Hasatan, 
But his Greek name is more of his job description of what he does. It's someone who continually throws and throws and throws and throws because he's trying to break through to something. He's trying one road. He has one method, one road where he's pestering, constantly attacking one area, trying to get through. That's what Diablos means. And that's what the devil does. And we see here that this woman pestered him daily. His name, Hasatan, means the accuser. He, what are these things he's throwing at us day after day? Accusations. Accusations. Trying to get you to believe something that's not true. And, and look, 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 look. He doesn't come to you and say, uh, you're guilty for killing that person. You didn't kill nobody. He's, not, he's smarter than that. He knows that's no temptation. So what does he do? He brings the law that you're dead to. Remember, you moved on. He brings the law and things you've actually broken. And he accuses you because remember, he knows the law better than you. He knows the scriptures better than you. And so he uses what God has for you as good and uses it against you. Remember what he did to Jesus? Doesn't the scripture say, if you throw yourself off, the angels will bear you up? And what did Jesus respond to? It is written. See, the devil will use what God meant for good against you, and he will continually pester you. And we think, man, what's wrong with me? Why am I? It's not just, it's not you, man. It's, we're in the middle of a war, and the devil hates you. The devil hates God. And so he's going to try to get through to you to stop God's assignment on your life. You have something so big on your life that God, only God can accomplish through you. And he's going to try to add anything he can to stop that. And it's through accusation after accusation after accusation. And he doesn't give up. Man, he's a persistent one. He does not give up. And look, he was successful at getting to Samson. Even in all of his strength, even in all of his victories, even how awesome the, the mighty deeds he did, yet he fell here. He gave in to the pestering. And let's look, though, let's fast forward to the next. And a champion went out from the camp of Philistine. Uh, oh. oh, yeah, let's look. This is Goliath. Um, and look what, Sam, look what Goliath did. I want you to see that the children of Israel were afraid of Goliath, not so much because of his size, but because of his words. You read this, verse 8, which we won't, and verse 16. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days morning and evening. Every morning, every evening, for 40 days, he's coming up trying to intimidate you, throwing accusations, throwing accusations, throwing accusations, attacking you, trying to get into your mind. And it's these words that made the children of Israel flee in terror. But then a young kid named David said, Who the heck does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is talking against my God? He believes something different. He wasn't intimidated by those accusations. He was confident in who God was and who he was to God. Let's go back. Yeah. Judges 15. And then it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and they shaved him and everything. And then verse 20, she said, and then the Philistines, now I want you to see this in verse 21. And the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. That when you leave your rest, you leave, you leave your perspective. You leave your perspective in life. Context of eternity. So many times we're thinking about the right now. The flesh doesn't live in, in, in the context of eternity. The flesh lives in right now. What's going to gratify me right now? What is it for me today? And that's why you can get so stressed out about things that haven't happened. You're, you're not thinking about eternity. You're not thinking in context of the cross. You're not thinking of these spiritual things and these heavenly things. And when you leave your rest, you leave your perspective, then now, because you're not resting, you're stressed out. And now the very people you love and the people that love you, one thing happens and you snap at them. And you start acting different. Your, your behavior begins to change and your attitudes begin to change. No longer are you excited about church or hearing and worshiping God and hearing about Jesus and, or, or spending time with it. Now you're, you're, you're pulled back and you're, you're set aside. Why? You've lost your perspective. You're not looking at things in context of eternity. You're not looking at the future that we have. Man, heaven is an amazing place, and we're only going to be there a short time, then we're coming back here. And these glorified bodies, man, are going to be insanely awesome. Like, you can walk through walls and you can eat, but our eating will be for pleasure only. We have an amazing future. I remember when I was a young Christian, I used to think about these things. I used to say, there's no way that is, that is true. There's no way all of that that's the future is true. And many people live in this earth today as if this is everything. They don't realize that this period on earth determines 
your destiny, your, your forever. Because Paul has a mystery and he says, look, all stars are stars. You're all going to heaven if you're saved. You're going to heaven, but not all stars look the same. Not all stars have the same brightness. Some stars are with greater glory. Some, you're still a beautiful, magnificent star, but you're not as big. He talks about our time here on earth. Jesus even said that the, those that have been faithful with the grace I've given them will be rulers over ten cities. And then there's this group over here that was somewhat faithful in his grace, rulers over five. And then there's this person over here that didn't, the grace of God was given to him in vain. They never received it. They never walked in it. They were trying to do everything on themselves, trying to do all the work themselves, trying to serve, trying to do this. See, even if I was building this church but not doing it by his grace, what's the point? It's not God. It's not his grace. So his grace would be towards vain. And you know what will happen? It won't end well. It won't end well because the flesh, the works of the flesh, we read in Galatians chapter 5, are not pretty. They are not pretty. Okay. And they bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. Next verse. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. So even when we mess up, it ain't over. It's never over with God. His, his mercy is forever. His everla it's everlasting. That's what David had confidence in was in his mercy. I will come to your sanctuary in the multitude of your mercy. However, the hair of the end of growth. Then Samson called the Lord, saying, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And we know the story. The lad put, placed his hands. And what did he do? Push the pillars. What is this a picture of? And Jesus, at his crucifixion, saved more people than he had during his, his earthly life. Samson killed at that ceremony more people than he had his whole rest of his life. It's a picture of Jesus. That even Samson, someone who committed some pretty gnarly sins, yet Jesus expressed himself through him. It's not about what you've done and who you are and who you think you are and who people tell you you are. That's irrelevant. But you make it relevant by allowing it in your mind. You make it relevant by dwelling on it and thinking of it and not what God says you are. And now real quick, I want to skip to, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Now, the armor of God. Real quick, I want to, I know I've had you for a little bit. You got a few more minutes to go through this yes, real fast? Before. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren. Now, I love this part, my brethren. This is all military style right here. My brethren, back in the Greek days, uh, Alexander the Great would call up one of his soldiers. They'd do big ceremonies, and he was the greatest military commander probably of all time. And he'd call up one of his commanders or, or soldiers and bring him up on stage and before everybody call him my brother. And it's a picture that people loved it that we are in this battle together. It's not me, Alexander the Great, and then you down there. No, we are on the same level, the same battle, the same playing field. You are my brother. I am your brother. And that's what Paul is doing. Sometimes we can look at Paul like, man, look at the revelation he had. But look, he's calling and saying, my brethren, you are in this with me. We are one in this. This is the same battle that we all go through. And I have some answers for you. And please understand that the church of Ephesus was the most uh, 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 intelligent, uh, powerful church of the day. That Paul himself planted the church. Uh, I believe with Aquila and Priscilla, and they planted the church, and they had uh, Paul taught daily from the school of Tyrannus for two years, and he was building up leaders, and from this church, the word of God spread throughout all Asia. There was such great revival from the church at Ephesus that scholars say today that it was the most powerful church of its time, that from this church, you know, I mean, for, for instance, John, the apostle John, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, moved from Jerusalem to attend this church. This is where they went to church, history says. So this church, I mean, Apollos learned, uh, learned about grace and a lot of things here at Ephesus. And this was a place where Paul went often. So you get the picture that this is the church of churches in that day. And yet it's like in the midst of everything that was going on, they had forgotten something. And Paul here at the end of the, the, the letter, he's saying finally. And that word finally isn't like in summary or the end. It's most important. Most importantly. Now, chapter 6 comes after chapter 5, which comes after chapter 4, chapter 3, chapter 2, chapter 1. 
Chapter 1 and 2 talk about the wealth and our seat in Christ. Yes. Chapter 3 and 4 and 5 talk about our walk in Christ. And chapter 6 talks about our stand in Christ. But before he can tell us about this standing against the wiles of the enemy, against the attacks and against the devil who's out there, he has to remind you to rest. Because you're already wealthy in Christ. He reminds you how to walk in him. But how well you walk is how well you rest. How well you rest in who he's made you. And then he gets here. Most importantly, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Now, I had it. this word, be strong, is the Greek word in dunamo, which the uh, Greek writers of that day would describe someone like Hercules. That Zeus empowered Hercules. They would say Zeus in dunamo Hercules to do great exploits, to do things that humans can't do. That's the Greek word that Paul chose to describe that this power is for us in the Lord. Now in chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Be, uh, he says, according to the working of God's mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. And then in chapter 3, he says, the power of God that's at work in you, that does exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ask or think. And now he's revealing to us what this is in chapter 6. Okay? So in dunamo, and this power is created in such a way that it's not like some free-floating power. It's created for vessels. The word en, in the beginning of the word, refers to and de it desires and needs a place to flow through. And you and I are the receptacles. It's created for us. This power is not just floating around. It's in you. That's the way it's designed. And God made you compatible for it. The new birth made you ready for it. And you're filled with it right now. Okay? And then in the power of his might. Now this word power of his might, it's only used one other time this way, and that's in Ephesians chapter 1, the power that God wrought in Jesus. And that word power isn't the normal word power of like du uh, dunamis, which means dynamite, where we get dynamite from. It's the word kratos with a K, like the kraken, you know, like the right, right. mighty. And it's, it's essentially a power reserved for God alone. It's the most powerful power if there is in the universe. It's not man's power. It never describes your power or anybody else's power. It's a power reserved for one thing. And it was the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Wow. And that's what God, that's what he's saying here, is that power that's is right. in you. Wow. Wow. That power that's the most powerful force in history and existence that raised Jesus from the dead. It says that that's when God used everything he had to raise him up and he raised you up with him. Wow. And that's what Paul's, so we see in English, he's strong in the Lord and the power is mine. You're like, okay, cool, you know what? But man, when you get into it and you yes. really start studying and you see the Greek, what he's referring to, I bet you're already feeling strong right now, right? Like me, you know? And But notice this, that where all of this is, is in the Lord. Question, are you in the Lord? You don't have to answer a lot. Yes, you are, yes. okay? You are in the Lord. So what do you have to do to access this power? You got to be in the Lord. You're in the Lord, so chill out, man. You're there. But when we don't rest in that, see, what Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1 about this power was is that you would know. Not that you would be filled with this power. Not that you would use this power, but that you would know. And that's what we're doing right now. He's reminding them at the end of it, my, my brethren, this is what's in you. This is what's available to you. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Yes. What are you worried about the devil for? And he's reminding them, though, check this out. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able. And that word may be able is the word for power, that you may have power to stand. And this word stand is a picture of a Roman soldier, part of the most powerful force on earth, standing straight up, shoulders back, chest out. You ain't afraid of nothing. That's this picture. It's all military all right, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, this word wiles sounds plural, but it's not. It's a singular. And actually what it means straight from English is a road. That's what it means. It's kind of weird. And what that means, it's, it comes from the Greek word methodos, which we get method. It's, it's, it's a road, one road which he has, which we talked about earlier. What is that one road that he's beating over and over, trying to throw accusation? His method, his way is to get to your mind, to beat down and build a stronghold in your mind. That's what he's saying the devil is out to do. Now check this out. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are not fighting people. People and things are not the problem. They never have been. We are in the middle of an intergalactic war that has been going on for ages between God and Satan. 
And here we are right smack dab in the middle of it. But you didn't get equipped with your own strength. It didn't say you be strong. It didn't say you fight. He said you put on God's armor. So let me ask you something. If I put God's armor on and you walk by my, but walk by me, who do I look like? God. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus lived 30 years as a 30-year-old, or you know, he lived 30 years, walked around Galilee, walked around Jerusalem, and not one time did a demon-possessed person, did a demon ever cry out. You're the son of God, have mercy on me, don't, don't hurt me, don't bend, right? Not one time. I know who you are, Jesus the Christ. Not one time. Until what happened? The baptism in the Jordan River when the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now as soon as he leaves, every demon in Israel is crying out, oh my gosh, I see you. I know who you are. Why, you think? It was his power. That embraced him, that filled him, that now this armor is on it. This armor isn't something, you know, it's like put on the armor. It's like, okay, you wake up in the morning, put my helmet on, put my belt on. You know, some people do that. It's fine if it helps you and everything. But it's not, you can't do that. It's, it's spiritual. It comes with being in the Lord. It's the power that's on you that the devil is trying to convince you of someone that you're not. Right? He, that's what he did with Adam and Eve. You guys will be like God. No, you're already like God. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to accuse you, accuse you, accuse you. So you got this armor on. And the devil knows what he's doing with. He sees you and he is afraid. I love the story of Smith Wigglesworth. He was laying in bed one day, one night, and uh, he was having a bad dream. And he awoke out of the bad dream. And there was this stench and this odor in the room. And he looked up at the foot of his bed. And, and Smith Wigglesworth said, there was the devil, Satan himself, standing at the foot of my bed. Wow. And you know what Smith Wigglesworth did? He said, Oh, it's just you, and went back to sleep. <laughs> See, sometimes I think we give a little too much credit to him and not realizing he's defeated. He's a bark with no bite. He has no bite. He has no strength. And another story I love, Lester Sumrall, he was in the Philippines or in one of the jungles, and he was sleeping, and all of a sudden this window opened up, and in comes this demonic creature, this demonic thing, and starts shaking his bed and moving his bed against the wall, moving it over. And he, or Lester Sumrall wakes up and he says, what? and he says, I recognize you, demon spirit. Get out in Jesus' name. And then the demon leaves and he says, wait, in Jesus' name, you put my bed back. And so the, the thing came back and brought, moved his bed back and then took off. You know, we have this idea, you know, Hollywood paints this picture of the devil of this big, ugly thing. They're like little imps, guys. They're like little monkeys that run around. All they do, and all they do is accuse you, throwing things at your head, trying to get in. And as long as you've got this armor on, there's no penetration. There's no getting through. He is afraid of you. He got whipped. See, he thought he had God by killing Jesus. He didn't realize that the crucifixion was God's way to bless us, to save us. He, in fact, Jesus would still be walking on the earth today if he knew it. He would have made sure that de Jesus never tripped, never got sick, nothing. He would surround Jesus with protection because as soon as Jesus died and carried our sins, then we'd be free. But he didn't know. He thought he got God. He thought, oh, here's your Savior. I'm going to kill him. Not realizing that the very harm he was doing to Jesus with the scourging, with the piercing, with the crown of thorns on his head was all from Scripture redemption for you and I. And Jesus, like a lamb before the slaughter, never said a word. He had to be careful because if he had said one thing, he might spill the surprise. He, he might, he might, you know, you don't know. And if he says one thing, oops, I didn't mean to rescue myself. You know, oh, it's one word. God will send 12 legions of angels to save me. He had to keep quiet. He was so much life, so much power that when the soldiers came to arrest him, he's like, he stepped in front of his disciples and said, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus, he said, I am. Boom! All the hundreds of soldiers fell flat to the ground. What did they experience? They experienced his power. Mm -hmm. That Kratos power that Jesus was walking with. Mm -hmm. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And this word wrestle, it comes from the Greek where like back in the day they used to have boxing matches in Greece. And these weren't just like boxing today. They, they would tie uh, uh, nails and razor blades and shards of metal to their boxing gloves. And it was almost a fight to the death. And you can go to museums and see the pictures of faces today of these boxers. Their, their faces look completely deformed. Nobody ever retired from the sport. 
You can guess why. They all die, right? Okay, and so that's what this word wrestling in that day refers. It's not just a, a little wrestling match like WF. This was a like a fight to the death. And he says, our fight, because you have to understand the battle, even though the devil's defeated, this battle in the mind is, is raging. Oh, right. It's a real battle going on. And if we're not recognizing it, we could fall victim to it. And so he says, look, I'm reminding you, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but look at this. This, this bewilders me. Principalities, powers, rules of darkness, and spiritual hustle with wickedness in heavenly places. The same hierarchy that God created with, the, with his armies of angels, with archangels, and then other leaders, and then other leaders, and other leaders. Satan has a very organized crime ring. He has, he has at the top, he has principalities that oversee nations. And then below them, he has uh, 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 the, the powers. And then below them, the darkness, the rulers of darkness. And then at the very bottom are the ones that are dealing with us, the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. There's a very organized crime ring going on and attacking the church. Therefore, find out what it's there for. Because of this, because we're wrestling against them, what is the answer? Don't be strong. Don't trust yourself. Don't try to fight. What do you do? Put on the armor. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. You know what I love about God in this Bible? It's notice evil day is singular, but in 1 Peter, it says good days, plural. God's, um, sometimes we're always expecting the evil day. God doesn't want you expecting the evil day. He wants you expecting good days, glorious days, because we are under his grace. It's an evil day. It's an evil moment, but it's a blessed life. It's a glorious life. Jesus was tempted for a season, and then the devil took off and left him alone. Gird your waist with truth. Let's, let's talk about this. Truth. Now, this, in, in a Roman soldier's uh, equipment, this would be the most inconspicuous, not noticed piece of armor that they had. You would not see it. You would not notice it. And it, it, it's not pretty or anything. It's a belt. But you know what? This belt was the most important piece of this Roman soldier's armor. You would never see it, but it was the foundation for all other armor. It's truth. And you say, like, I was asked the other day, like, what, what is truth? What, what is truth? You know, because you got truths everywhere. You got this person saying this truth. You got this method, this formula, this thing, this thing. What is truth? And even people look in here, and I'm being very careful. Even people in here, they look and they read and they say something and say, that's truth. Yes, it's true, but there is a truth above all truth. And this truth isn't just a teaching, it's not a doctrine, it's not a formula, it's not a method, it is a person. Truth isn't some idea floating on out there that's on TV or what someone's saying. Truth is a person named Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what's amazing about this truth, where we can get off, is that God puts truth on a very distinguished side. John chapter 1 says, the law was given through Moses, but, and there's this dividing line, grace and truth came through Jesus. So truth isn't on the law side of the butt. It's not the law and truth, but grace came through Jesus. It's because God wants you to see something. Truth is on the grace side, unmerited favor. Because grace reigns. Grace is above the law. Grace is above sin. Sin has no power against grace in your life. Romans 6.14 says, Sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So what is truth? It is a person. a person, And what is he full of? Grace. What is the belt of truth that holds everything together? Remember, this belt allows you to run. It keeps your pants from falling and you being embarrassed. It keeps your, your sword of the spirit hooked on. The shield of faith hooked on the other side. It allows for everything to withstand. Everything to make sense. Everything to work together. The truth of God's grace. Next. Breastplate of righteousness. Now, this would have been the most beautiful piece of armor that the soldiers had on. It was made of a brass or, or bronze, and it was already shiny. But the longer the soldier had been in battle, the longer the soldier had been wearing it, it was made of scales. And every time they would walk or move, the scales would rub against each other, thus polishing it further. It's like a picture of the righteous man whose path gets brighter and brighter and brighter 
until the day of Jesus. That is not getting worse. Nothing about this Christian life gets worse and less and less. It only gets brighter and greater and yes. greater. And this breastplate of righteousness covered the front and covered the back. And it was allowing them to, uh, it, would, it would be the most beautiful piece that would someone walk by and they would see that. They would see, that's a Roman soldier. There's something about you that's standing out. And that's the righteousness of God. And what is it there to protect your heart? Jesus said, if you believe with your heart and not doubt, you shall have what you say. And that doubt comes from condemnation. So the breastplate of righteousness that Jesus has made unto me my righteousness. You are not your own righteousness, but the Lord is my righteousness. And in 1 Corinthians, Jesus has made a good kick to someone and stab him. And these shoes also had a metal piece that covered their, their shin. And what is this a picture of that your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? That everywhere you go, wherever you walk, you have peace with the God of the universe. And why do we have peace, though? Again, what is this pointing to? The belt of truth points to who? <laughs> Jesus as our truth. The breastplate of righteousness, Jesus as our righteousness. This, our peace, Romans, 1, uh, Romans 5, verse 1, says that we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God. And because we have peace with God, we are standing in his grace, rejoicing in the confident expectation of enjoying his glory. It's because of what Jesus did that we have peace with God. So the next. Shield of faith. Who is our faith? Running unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is the same faith that was the working of God that raised Jesus from the dead. And you know what's cool about the Roman infantry when you got, they would measure you. And this, this shield in Greek means door. It was as tall as you were and as wide as you were. It was this big thing that no one could get through it or bypass it. And it says that God gave you the measure of faith. He measured you out, your life. He knows what you need, and you are fully prepared for everything. Next. The helmet of salvation. What is this out to protect? Your mind. That I, salvation, is not from my works. It's by his grace and his grace alone. When you point everything to Jesus, that Jesus is our salvation, Jesus is our faith, our righteousness, our peace, and our truth. You can't be defeated. Go to the next. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Obviously, we know what the Word of God is. Right? We talked about it last week. Jesus. Jesus is the Word that became flesh. And look at this. This isn't like memorizing and, and memorizing books and chapters and constantly reading. Look, the people, the church, and the, that day, they didn't. Have, they, a lot of them couldn't read. They didn't have Bibles like we do today. So what is it? It's 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 for for me. I'll be reading something, and a verse jumps out. The Holy Spirit brings something, and that's where the double-edged sword comes in. It's sharp. And it pierces. It might just be one word from God, one thing that stands out, and I take that. And I got, for me, when I needed a wife, when I was praying to God for all my wife, he gave me a scripture for my wife that came to fruit. Whatever it is for my child, whatever it was, you meditate that, and it becomes real. Okay, and you fight with it. Uh, next one, the lance. Now, the Roman soldiers had seven pieces of armor, but you don't find the lance. He doesn't write about it, but he talks about praying in the spirit with all supplication and everything. Prayer being the lance. The lance that the soldier had back in the day could either be thrown at the enemy and keep the enemy at bay, or it could be in close combat used to separate yourself. And that's what prayer is. It's very definite. It's very, uh, and there's all kinds of different prayers, but we don't have time to go into that. So let's just go to the next one. And in Colossians 2, we'll close with this. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. What was the handwriting that was against us? The law. The law. And specifically, the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. That's the only part of the law that God wrote with his finger. Mm -hmm. That was against you. And that was nailed to the cross of Jesus. Having disarmed. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the devil at one time was armed with something. He had a weapon. He had a fight. What was it? It was the law. And Jesus disarmed him. He's no longer armed with that law that says who you are and who you're not and what you've lived up to be and the standards that you're living. It's all by his grace and his grace alone. Having made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. In it. And that public spectacle... Back in that day, the Romans, what they would do is after conquering a king, they would take that king and the, for the parade back in Rome. They would bring that king and put his head in that wooden thing and the arms hanging out and parade him through the streets of Rome. And all the citizens of Rome were out in the streets 
doing celebration, drinking, and, and having a party because the king has been defeated. And that's what Jesus did to the devil. Jesus made a public spectacle of them, disarming him that he has nothing to fight you with. So what does he do? Is he takes accusations, little things, brings you back to the law, so he can get you back under the light, and get you back in sin, get you back in condemnation, get you back in guilt, and instead of living in this, having forgiven you all trespasses. Because no one in the Bible is like, uh, nowhere in the Bible does say God gave, forgave me my future sins. And I said, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say he forgave you your past sins. Yeah. It's all sins. That's it. It's simple. We don't have to complicate this. It's real easy. Jesus ain't coming back to die again. Either all your sins were forgiven, or they weren't, and we're in trouble. you got to find another yeah. way. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let's all stand. Uh, we're gonna